Okay, so welcome to the second lecture of our uh, course on geographic information systems. Um, as we discussed in the last lecture about what a GIS is, today we're going to kind of get into the nitty gritty and talk about the foundational portion of this, which is obviously coordinate systems. Before we get into any sort of um, computer aspects, it's important to know what coordinate systems are and what projections are so that you're not confusing the difference between the two. So your review of last time is basically, you know, what is a GIS? So you have an early effort here in 1969 by Ian McCarg at UPenn in which he basically took uh, a bunch of different features or a bunch of different analytics of an area that were color coordinated on thin sheets of paper and then he flattened them out and was able to see what areas were uh, best suited or worse or worse off for an uh, for whatever he was trying to measure according to the um, the color of whatever he was looking at. So as I mentioned before, um, GIS is obviously an integration of very different things that includes things like social factors, biodiversity, engineering, land use, environmental considerations. And it's really the basis of this layering and uh, multiple factors that really is what GIS is, right? And so a map can just be a topographic map but GIS is itself is not just topography. It is everything combined that allows us to view the whole of an area. Um, and this is what allows us to make those decisions that are so important that come with geographic information. So let's go back over these, uh, these definitions. Uh, from a process standpoint, a GIS is a computer-based system that provides collection, storage, analysis, and display of georeference data. Whereas in a problem or uh, solving orientated definition, it's much more about the decision making. It's basically a support system that uses spatially referenced data in a problem solving environment. It basically says, okay, wh what if this happened? Or if I change blank, what will then happen, right? And it allows us to make those decisions. So where does that leave us in terms of coordinate systems? Well, in reality, coordinate systems and scale of a map is really the fundamental portion of what we're looking at. So uh, at a baseline, uh, I know this, a lot of this early stuff is probably going to be pretty elementary to most of you, but it's important to go over it so that once we get into stuff later on, it's not as, um, it's guaranteed that you know what, uh, what we're referring to rather than, you know, having to go back and look at something. So Map scale is obviously a ratio between distance on the map and a corresponding distance on the earth. And it's always expressed as one to blank. So in this case, it's uh, one to 100,000. And there are really four common scales. Really there's three, but technically if you're working at a global scale, one to one million is technically a common scale, but uh, you will rarely ever find yourself outside of a data perspective of one to 250,000. Um, and you're really hoping for that in most cases uh, for that one to 24,000, depending on the question. Um, as an archaeologist myself, I definitely want the smallest uh, one to 24,000 as much as I can because it allows me to have a much finer resolution. Speaking of resolution and scale and extent, um, normally when we see a large number, our assumption is, is that number it means it is a larger feature. Uh, and when it comes to map scale, that's obviously not the case. And that's because we're dealing with a ratio. Uh, so when we're looking at the larger map here, 1 to 100,000 1 100, would actually seem like the larger map, but it's actually not. Uh, the, the example on the map is actually going to be smaller in 100,000 than it would be for 24,000. And so basically what that means is if we're looking at 1 to 24,000, it is going to be a large scale that is very fine resolution and is probably a small extent. Whereas 100,000 is probably going to be a small scale with a coarse resolution and a large extent. And basically what that means is that your scale is a measurement of um, ratio or the size of something on the map in relation to the actual size on the globe. Your resolution is the how fine you can see something and how um, detailed the map actually is. So can you see a railroad or can you not basically? Can I see an archeological site or can I not? And then the extent is again, uh, the distance covered by a single map face. 
So when any coordinate systems, there are essentially three basic things, and that's an origin, uh, which is in which every point is then measured from. So it's usually marked as a zero, zero, uh, and then every point from then on is measured from the zero, zero with a defined direction in a distance. And so using this great map uh, right here, which it really is a map, I mean, in a lot of ways, the XY graph here, the zero, zero is obviously the bottom left. Um, and then every point outside of that that is then measured has two uh, two areas that are measuring the height and the the I guess width away from the zero zero the distance from the zero zero either way if we were to extend this whole x y graph out into a total cross we'd actually end up having four different distinct uh, uh, quadrants in which these would have, uh, we'd start moving into the negatives. So to the left, we'd have one number to the left uh, in the negative and one in the positive. If we move to the bottom left, we'd have both numbers in the negative. And then again, to the bottom, just below this, what we're seeing in this graph, we'd end up seeing something that's in uh, one number in the negative and then one in the positive. So there are really two categories of coordinate systems. There's the spherical coordinate systems, which is what everybody knows and thinks of when we're thinking of coordinate systems. And then there's the uh, rectangular coordinate systems. And so uh, uh, we're gonna start off with your uh, spherical coordinate systems first, which are right here with uh, basically the assumption that the globe is a sphere. Uh, and this is really where it becomes a problem. So your spherical coordinates are essentially your uh, Latitude and longitude. Baseline, I really can't simplify it anymore. You could also call them uh, meridians and parallels. It's meaning the same thing. Um, the problem is with this is that there are some issues in which you kind of, I'll kind of get into in the next couple of slides, but uh, it doesn't always work for when you're doing actual GIS or doing measurement across an area. Um, just having coordinates kind of causes some issues. So what would those issues be? Well, it's really more about the longitude, but starting with latitude, uh, measured in north or southward from the equator, it ranges from zero to 90 degrees north or south, and then the measuring is uh, obviously degrees, minutes, and seconds. And so one degree equals 60 minutes, and one, uh, one minute equals 60 seconds. It works just like it would a clock normally. And so the length of one degree latitude is similar to something roughly to 111 kilometers or 69 miles. And the beauty of latitude is the fact that it is pretty much equidistant across the globe. If it's going to be measured somewhere, your latitude is essentially the same distance. So 111 kilometers in New Hampshire as it would be in South Korea. That is not the case with longitude. And this is really where your geographical coordinate systems become an, an issue, right? Or your, or your geometric, excuse me, coordinate systems become an issue. Um, longitude is measured east-west from the prime meridian at, from Greenwich, uh, England to the international dateline. And it measures zero to 180 degrees west. The measuring units are the same distance uh, as latitude. But the real kicker here is that the length of one degree longitude varies. Uh, in reality, it is never actually the same in that the further north you get or the further south you get toward the pole, that distance is severely reduced. And so what you end up getting is a, as a, is smaller zones or smaller little squares that are not actually perfect squares across the globe. It's fine to measure latitude, but longitude causes an issue. Uh, this graph actually probably shows it better than anything I could actually ever depict. But as you can see here, you end up having something that has uh, almost no ground to cover in the uh, as you get north or south. But the closer you are to equator, you have these very large, very almost perfectly square boxes uh, that are perfectly well measured and almost square. But it, it changes and that causes issues within math and, and measurements of an area. So when we read longitude and latitude, we'd actually read this as 4253 and 7853 west. So in plain English, that is 42 degrees, 53 minutes latitude north, 78 degrees, 53 minutes longitude west. Okay, now that we've got the um, grade school um, coordinates out of here, we can now talk about the real stuff. 
uh, rectangular coordinate systems. This is really where uh, the rubber hits the road and we're starting to really talk about maps. So uh, rectangular coordinate systems are also known as planar, Cartesian, or grid coordinate systems. They are slightly different in the sense that they kind of all require something slightly different about their origin or how they are presented on a map. But for the most part, they are essentially the same group. And what they do is that they have the assumption that you have converted the Earth's curved surface onto a flat map. And the X is given first, and it's called an easting. And then the Y is given a value, and it's called the northing. So you have the most east area and, the north, and then the northing, right? Uh, and the original big daddy of all rectangular coordinate systems here is the universal transverse mercator. Um, it is like the metric system. It actually, I believe, is part of the metric system, if I'm not mistaken. If it's not, it essentially is ruled as the same. Uh, and it's a rectangular coordinate system for the world. Originally, obviously, named after Mercator. Uh, I don't believe it was actually designed by him, but it's a reflection of his original map projection, which was the first flat map projection of the globe. Uh, with UTM, so Universal Transverse Mercator, the measuring unit's obviously a meter. This is where it gets great. Uh, because it's a meter, everything is very easily measured, and the map projection is obviously Universal Transverse Mercator as well. Uh, there's kind of kind of some confusion here. Uh, basically, what this means is that there's a map projection called Transverse Mercator, and there's also a coordinate system called Universal Transverse Mercator, and more or less, they are two different things with the same name. Uh, they are slightly different in terms of what they do, but if you are working in one, chances are you're working in the other. Uh, the change here from longitude to latitude is that there's actually things called zones. Uh, and zones run in north-south columns of six degrees longitude, uh, and they're labeled one to 60 east, starting at uh, 180. Um, and then rows are measured as east-west rows of 8 degrees latitude, uh, labeled C through X without I and O beginning at 80 degrees south. Uh, the reason for that is basically Roman numerals. If you don't want O because it's too close looking to zero and you don't want I because it could be mistaken for one. And what that basically does is creates really nice, perfect squares. As you can see from this graph, you have this beautifully flat projected map that is perfect squares from the subarctic, or actually from the Arctic, all the way to Antarctic, and everything in between. Uh, UTM zones, like I said before, they are, you know, the going north, or going, excuse me, they're the longitude um, explanation for the Universal Transverse Mercator. While we almost always use these zones, so UTM zone 14 is 42 south to 42 north uh, is in this graph, we almost never use the rows. And the reason for that is that because latitude is almost all, or not almost always, it's always the perfectly distant and there's never any changing. If you're measuring 111 degree or measuring latitude, it's always 111 kilometers in terms of the next parallel. Whereas in long or in longitude, that obviously changes. So you have zones to convert that are basically the replacement of longitude. So you have this nice square and latitude gets to stay. So uh, each of these zones, each of the 60 zones, has its own central meridian, and a central meridian of a zone is given the easting of 500 or 500,000 meters, and the equator is given a northing of zero for the northern hemisphere. So each zone is five, uh, has a central meridian, yeah, five, uh, 500,000, and then zero is the equator, right? So below anything below that is going to change. Uh, basically, what happens at the equator is that there's then a transition into a completely different um, measurement system and where the equator then has a value of 10, 000, or 10 million excuse in meters. So uh, let's talk about zone conversion from longitude to latitude. Um, this is really the only portion of today and where we're going to be talking about math, but um, it's kind of important that you know the formula here, uh, mainly because it's, it's simple enough and uh, I don't know if there's a perfect coordinate translation. Obviously, if you were doing this in a GIS, I think you could do this pretty easily, but there's a very easy formula. So if you have the longitude, so in this case, we take 7158. 
you minus the longitude from 180 and then divide by 6 and round to the nearest number. So with 7158, you would minus that from 180 and divide by 6, giving you something like zone 18. Uh, it's going to be just over, the final product's going to be just over 18, but you would round down to get zone 18 here. So now let's finally get on to the, you know, the wonderful mistake by the U.S. Um, I really don't know what else to call it here. Uh, it's kind of like not converting to the metric system like the rest of the world. It's just one of those antiquated things that we hold on to as like a reflection of being different or being superior. I don't know what the goal is here, but either way, it, it's a complete cluster mess and uh, not much else can be said. So state plane is the rectangular coordinate system for the U.S. and the measurement is obviously a foot. And from there, you know where this is going. If you know anything about metric and, and the uh, original foot. Um, but uh, zones are essentially the same thing as UTM, except for the U.S. is divided excuse me, into 120 zones. And zone boundaries get to follow state and county lines. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second and let you think about that. 120 zones, the zone boundaries follow state and county lines. Did you figure it out? It's going to be a mess. And there it is. It's an absolute mess. Uh, this is a state plane map that shows all of the different zones in the United States. Uh, as you can tell, there are a couple of states that really, for the most part, are small enough or don't have enough people in them in which you just have a single state plane zone, uh, which allows for a little bit easier. But then you have other states that are completely different uh, that have multiple zones within them. Uh, and the beauty of this is that there are some, as you can see, that have run north-south and others that run east-west. And that does not make anything easier. So here, let's start getting into the, the real mess up here. So projections of each zone, uh, it has its own projection system. For states that run in a north-south extent, it runs on a transverse Mercator projection. But states that run on an east-west extent, they run on a Lambert's conformal comic conic system. Uh, the central <laughs> the central meridian of the zone is given a false easting of 2 million and the false origin is established to the southwest. So you take the bottom right, you get that's a zero zero. Uh, and they're basically uh, a false easting and a false northing. Uh, and that's essentially because it's not UTM and therefore it needs to be fake because it doesn't actually exist in itself of its zone. And to make everything worse, zones overlap. And the reason that zones overlap is because we're dealing with something that's such an old system that it just did, the technology wasn't there to be accurate enough. And so you have, a, you end up with zones that just don't, they don't, they don't talk to each other. And don't even get me started if you're trying to do something across state boundaries. I mean, I don't know what you would do if you're dealing with something in Illinois or Indiana and trying to measure the two because they're completely different way. They're completely different areas. So as you can see here, uh, this is one of my favorite project. Uh, this is one of my favorite images to show the absolute mistake of using state plane. Uh, as you can see in red, that is the UTM projection. The blue is the Lambert's projection. And the green, if you can see it and you're not slightly colorblind, uh, is the unprojected latitude and longitude. They are all very different. Uh, and you have to do a conversion to them. And the only way to really do that now is to end up doing that in the, uh, into a GIS because you don't want to have to do all of that conversion by math. But it, it's just not, not worth it. It, it's so much easier if you can just stay in UTM and avoid state having to be in state plane. So uh, let's kind of get out of the state plane. I'm kind of off my stoke box about why state plane has got so many issues. Um, but try to use the rectangular systems as much as possible and not to use the geographic coordinate systems or the geometric. So you don't want to use the longitude and latitude. And the reason for that is that what we discussed earlier in the idea that uh, the calculation is going to be off. If you have longitude in an area, 
in which you're closer to the pole, that, that calculation is going to be very different than what it would be at the equator. And so it's always better to stick to rectangular. Remote sensed, in, remotely sensed images and digital elevation models, so your satellite imagery or your LIDAR or uh, essentially the final product of uh, elevation uh, measurements, they're almost always in UTM. And for that reason, I highly, highly recommend that any work or calculation done stays in UTM. Uh, the only time that you would ever really try to have to be forced into using state plane, I guess is better to say it, is if you're working in the United States and you're working with DEETS. Uh, the land record system is routinely using state plane, which may have something to do with the reason that when you're dealing with large parcels of land, there almost always seems to be a problem with surveying and measuring of old DEETS. And that's mainly due to the fact that it's in state plane and the measurement wasn't great. They would use projections and hand measurements of the old rock by the tree, um, which isn't a great measurement or a great uh, coordinate measurement either. Uh, and you should know how to convert between these projections. Uh, when I say you need to know how to do it, uh, like I say here, it, it will be discussed in the first lab or the second lab, I can't remember. Um, but it basically... It's very simply, it's a couple of buttons in a GIS. Um, almost all of them, actually all of the GI, major GIS have an ability to convert between projections. And so it's not something you have to worry about doing for yourself. So let's get to datums. Uh, datums are essentially the, the zeros or the markers in which are the foundations for all of these types of projections. So when we're dealing with uh, elevation, you have what's called a vertical datum. And it's the zero surface from which all elevations or heights are measured. So if you have a zero, it's going to be flat. And then anything above it is going to have a measurement. Or anything below, I guess, technically would also be allowed. But it would end up being a negative. If you're working where, near the coast, uh, more often than not, your vertical datum is going to be sea level. Uh, but obviously, that's going to be slightly different if you're working in some place like Colorado. However, uh, you know, the vertical datum is only part of the story. The other portion is obviously the horizontal or the one that covers the landmass, and that's called the geodetic datum. Uh, and it's essentially established to provide positional control, uh, basically to support surveying. Uh, and it covers large areas such as a country, continent, or the whole world. Uh, the two main ones that we're going to end up using are the North American datum of 1927, which was a people's work project, uh, people's public works, people's... It's essentially uh, part of the uh, New Deal by FDR. I, I can't remember the exact uh, public works project that was signed into legislation by him for this, but it's, it's a surveying project that was signed in as part of putting people back to work after the Great Depression. It was then redone in 1983, and you have the 1983 datum. In 2011, a second or a third I guess is a third is re, uh, format is released by USGS but it's not a full surveying project it's more of a computer simulation of the change in coordinates according to the 1983 in 1983 uh, in 1927 there is some change in the coordinates from the area as you can see from the example in California here okay let's get to map projections so what they are is essentially a means of converting coordinates on a curved surface to a way to converting them to something on a flat surface. Your map projections define how positions on the Earth's curved surface are transformed onto a flat piece of paper, whereas your coordinate systems are superimposed onto that flat surface, providing a referencing framework on which the positions are measured. Uh, what that basically means is that um, a map projection is a way of flattening the sphere. If you were to take something and just squish the earth flat as if it were a clementine shell or a clementine skin, I guess is a better way of referring to that. How you would do that is the map projection. And the coordinate system is what you then use as a reference system. So whatever bump or whatever area, how you're going to measure the location of that um, example. Um, and really what that causes is expl it explains how you're going to... Um, evaluate error. If you have a map projection, you're going to have inherent error because you can't take a sphere or an ellipsoid, I guess is technically the better one, 
uh, and reflect it correctly onto a flat piece of paper because there's always going to be some issues. So for that reason, you could just take uh, a projection system and put it directly onto the ellipsoid, like um, latitude and longitude. However, latitude and longitude, like we discussed earlier, has some error that's built in and you can't account for it. The distance and the constantly changing distance between different uh, parallels or meridians. Is it meridians? Excuse me, it's meridians. Um, basically means that it makes for calculation to be extremely difficult when you're doing that. And so you need to flatten the earth out so you can then then project a coordinate system. And what that basically does is it provides a baseline of a zero sum error for your, um, your coordinate system. While there are, er there's error built into whatever the projection is, you assume that is the flat error rate for the coordinate system rather than adding to it with something that's already messed up like you would with or the latitude and longitude. So let's get into these different types of projections. So uh, by a conceptual message, you have cylindrical, azimuthal, and conic. And then by distortion, you have conformal, equal area, equidistant, and azimuthal. So in the cylindrical projection, you have two types, really. You have the Mercator, which is the one that was the original Mercator projection, uh, and the transverse Mercator. And as you can see from these great little graphs here, if you took a cylinder and you stuffed the globe inside of it, the Mercator is if the cylinder were sitting on the table flat on, the, uh, flat on one side and you flattened it out. However, a transverse Mercator assumes that the cylinder is sitting on a table on its side and is then flattened. So again, for your azimuthal, you have something basically looking down from the top or from the bottom of the earth, depending on where you're trying to measure. Uh, that really doesn't do much for measurement or really for looking at the globe unless you're trying to look at something in the Antarctic or the, uh, or the Arctic. Uh, and so it's rarely used uh, except for in some very uh, specific points. Conic is the same idea as if you were to take a cone and put it on top of the globe and uh, unfurl a section of it. Conic works well in a quarter of the globe or less. And so what I mean by that is if you took the northwest hemisphere and used a conic projection, that's fine. But if you took one entire Western Hemisphere and a conic projection, that's not going to look okay. Uh, and so let's go by distortion. So your conformal shapes, it retains shapes about a point. Equal area projections retain the correct relative size, whereas equidistant projection retains uniform scale in all directions, but only from one or two points. So what that basically means is that, yeah, it's a relative scale that's correct, but when you're actually looking at the uh, further than one or two areas, it's not going to be as uh, accurate because you can't get that uh, relative scale correct by more than probably three points. Uh, and then obviously your azimuthal retains correct direction in one or two points, but it doesn't really account for correct scale. So uh, in terms of dis distortions, uh, your conformal preserves shape, your uh, equivalent preserves area, your it also well, there's actually two areas, I should say there. Uh, and then your compromise is uh, preserves neither. I'm not really sure of the point of a compromise. I've never really figured it out. Personally, this is what I had in my third and fourth and probably fifth grade classroom. Uh, I really think it has more to do with the fact that it's teaching students that this is in fact the globe, but it is on a flat piece of paper and you need to understand it as such. So uh, commonly used projections are obviously the transverse Mercator. It's the cylindrical conformal, and then your Lambert's conformal conic. Uh, same idea, it's even tied in there. So it's conforming to it and taking care of it. Uh, this link here is going to be a YouTube video that's going to show basically an unwrapping and an explanation according to, with paper, according to how different map projections work. So. This is really the key here, the key takeaway here. Uh, I really want to make sure that this is nailed down without uh, having any issues because this is really where the universal transverse mercator and the transverse mercator uh, splits. So UTM or universal transverse mercator is a coordinate system, meaning it has a measurement or a way of predicting and giving scale to a flat projection. 
transverse mercator is that projection. It is a way of flattening the sphere and understanding what is on the surface. So you flatten the, the sphere in the cylinder and that's transverse mercator. UTM is then the grid system that's placed on top of that flattened sphere and which you can then take measurements and do observations with. So if you were reading and catching up with the books uh, for the normal textbook, this would be chapter two. Um, and if you're not, I, this is what we would have been talking about. I'm going to sneak this last little tidbit in before the end of the lecture today, uh, mainly because I don't really have another place to talk about it, as, as you can see from the syllabus for next time. Uh, our next lecture is actually going to be a much more deep dive into the foundations of, of geographic programming, and so I don't really want to have to be explaining what the difference of these types of maps are. And there's not really a better way to tie it in until much later, but I think it's important that we talk about topographic maps now rather than later. So your planimetric maps are basically graphical representations of the shape of the horizontal locations of physical features and other uh, physical entities. So um, where rail lines are, what that mountain look, out shape would look like, where the park is, what archaeological sites are shaped like, what the rock formation is, where the town is. It's those types of things that are on our planimetric maps, whereas topographic maps identify elevation of the land and contour maps. If you look at the background of this lecture, that is essentially what you're going to get with a contour map. It's going to be squiggly lines that are essentially a representation of um, the elevation of a landscape. So topographic maps in terms of USGS. So it's actually a map series that's been published by, the U by USGS ooh, probably for the last century or more now. Um, it's bound by parallels on the north, south, and meridians on the east and west, and it covers a 7.5 span in either direction, so basically 7.5 degrees in either way, um, and the maps are created using aerial photos, and basically uh, orthocorrecting for them. Uh, the features, however, are not just topography. It also shows vegetation, rail lines, streams, roads, and urban things, um, there's, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but that's that's really what it would include. Uh, and then the beauty of these wonderful maps, which are really the foundation of what most people use when they're in the field, um, are going to be the three coordinate systems that are also there. So you have the geographical coordinates, so your latitude and longitude, the UTM coordinates that you're always looking for, and then on top of that, it's going to have state plane, and that's because you're dealing with uh, more often than not, I don't believe USGS has information outside of the United States. They may have Mexico and Canada, but I don't think there's anything in Europe. But they're going to have the state plane measurements of this area as well. And the only time you would again use that is if you were having to work with um, historic deeds. Okay, so that is the end of this lecture. Uh, I'm going to end it here. Uh, on next week, we're going to start in on the basics of geo. Uh, geographic programming and really starting to get into uh, what a GIS is at its fundamental computer base. Um, I believe that's all I have. You should be looking for your lab within the next two lectures. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to reach me. All right, bye.